All right, how's it going, everybody? My name is Antonio, and I'm back this week again for some resource talks. This time it's with Lobo Tigre, and you know this is not your usual predictions of uh, where uranium and gold are going. Uh, although I assume they're both going up, we're also not doing any doomsday predictions this time. But we're gonna try to be more educational, which basically means I'm gonna try and get a lesson out of Lobo Tigre on um, the mining cycle. And uh, the, the the life cycle, basically, of, of this crazy industry that we're in right now and how it all works, the pros and cons of each step along the way, prospect generators, explorers, developers, producers, and so on and so forth. Maybe even a little bit of royalty. So uh, lots to talk about there. And, and uh, I guess I'll just shut up now. And, and Lobo, thank you for investing your time in me. Happy to help you and your audience. Pleasure is all mine. I um. I don't necessarily know where to start it. I do know that I've been looking at the Lasan curve. This is pretty much like the first thing, I guess, that you get exposed to. One of the first things that you get exposed to when you start looking into this industry. And, and it's this beautiful thing that explains everything in one graph. And it almost doesn't need a video in and of itself. But so where where, where, where do you even start explaining the, the life cycle of a mineral discovery? We can break it down into steps. But maybe an important thing even before we go there is I would actually start as a as an investor, as a speculator looking at this, I would actually start um, to the right of my left ear and to the left of my right ear, as our friend Rick Rule likes to say, and ask myself, you know, what is my risk reward tolerance? What am I looking for? What kind of investor am I? What kind of volatility can I handle? Because, you know, the, the life cycle of, of mineral exploration of a mining company or a mining company to be, because you're not mining at the beginning. Um, you know, there's different risks and and along the way. And if you're very risk averse, you maybe want to skip the life cycle and just go to the producers, maybe even the biggest producers, the, the biggest go-to names that have already arrived at so-called end cycle, but are making money and, and will uh, profit with the uh, rise of metals prices on anything that you're bullish on. You know, it's a simple way to just look at that. If you want hockey sticks, though, if you're trying to maximize gains, then you need to go earlier in the life cycle. And that's why we care about this. So, but, but it starts with yourself. If you know that if you buy something and it drops 50% without any bad news from the company, just because the markets are volatile and you can't handle that, um, you know, you will end up buying high and selling low, reversing the formula. And that, that's really important. So that that's actually my starting point is do some, some hard soul searching, look in the mirror, ask yourself what you can handle and then look at the life cycle and where it's appropriate for you. So you're basically saying, think about risk first and foremost. Think about how much risk you can afford to to carry in your personal portfolio. Do you have a like a formula or something to to? Well, one size on? doesn't fit all, obviously. What I'm saying is know thyself. I mean, if you know, if you've had past instances where it just freaked you out, you couldn't take the heat, something went down, and then later you kicked yourself because it went up after you sold. You know, not everybody learns from that lesson. If if that's you, then be honest with yourself about that and maybe stick with the companies that are less likely to be that volatile. You know, if if you're 19, got no kids, got some beer money you saved up and you want to put it on a very early stage, you know, Hail Mary play, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Not much. So, you know, th that can affect your your appetite for risk. But hey, who knows? You might be a 19-year-old who's very risk averse. You want to be an accountant when you grow up. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with accountants, Antonio. I feel seen. Uh, so, so I, I, yeah, I really think know thyself is the very first step. So even before the time, because I'm looking at the timeline here and it says first thing is concept, but it sounds like there's a, a pre-concept type of thing where you need to Think, yeah, I mean, you need, yes. you need to think about your own portfolio. I suppose that, I mean, if, if someone's watching this and they don't necessarily know or understand this life cycle already, uh, a, a good rule of thumb would be just to do not go all in at, at, sure. in, in, in any case. If you, if you don't even understand this, there's, there's no way in any situation for anybody out there that, that it would be prudent for them to go all in. All right. Okay. So that having been said, another way of looking at it too is just the earlier in the life cycle, the higher the risk. Yeah. Okay. Well said. Would there and, is there would you ever or have you ever used like a structure uh, or a framework to structure your portfolio around where you because it's something I tried and I failed very badly where I said I'm gonna do you know twenty percent discover uh, the, the um, 
development um, companies and I'm going to do 10% explorers. And then later on in the cycle, I'm going to reverse that. Is that something you, you would ever do? No. Um, I When I started in this business, I, you know, I was handed Doug Casey's portfolio and it was already built and full of all this stuff. And, you know, had, had to do some house cleaning on it. And, and then we went from there. So there was never that kind of structure. And then over the years of working in this space, I've come to the conclusion that, um, you know, when you try to, when you try to speculate based on a spreadsheet, you're asking for errors. It's very, very difficult. And if anybody could come up with any formula or spreadsheet that, that tells you where to invest, when and how and how much and so on, you know, if they really, if you could mathematize it that way, everybody would do it and there'd be no profit in that. That that's, wouldn't stay secret for long. And, you know, when I see people trying to do that, uh, I think they end up with results very similar to yours. It's, it's an inherently chaotic uh, market. It's highly, highly volatile. Until cryptos came along, Doug Casey used to call the mining stocks the, the most volatile stocks on earth. Uh, nowadays, okay, uh, cryptos aren't stocks. They're, they're whatever they are. Uh, but uh, investors have access to even greater volatility. So I'm, I'm not sure we can make that claim anymore. But they're still incredibly volatile. Uh, there's so, in fact, I, you know, the, the grandmaster himself of intelligent investing, Graham, Benjamin Graham, wrote in securities analysis that uh, he mentioned mining as being too volatile to be uh, amenable to the type of securities analysis that he and Dodd wrote about in their seminal book almost 100 years ago. So no, no, no formula. And I can cap this off by saying, you know, a truly great speculation, Antonio, just, you know, it ticks all the boxes and it's in the right commodity at the right time that, you know, the technicals are there, the fundamentals are there, maybe even the storium is there too. And it's a great company. It's, it's got the right people. The project looks fantastic, but still undervalued for some reason, the market hasn't caught on, you know, like a truly great speculation is so rare that I don't want to say, no, no, I've already got 20% allocation to that. So I'm, I'm going to skip on that, right? I, I, would, I would never do that. I would buy it. And then maybe if I start getting too heavy in one area of my portfolio, you know, look to lighten up, take some more profits or, or look harder for something in another area. But, but you know, it's, it's just a, such a rare thing that that is my method. My, my only method really is to insist on something that I can really get excited about. This looks like a great speculation and I'm willing to put my money there. That's well said because I've flipped exactly from the first thing with the framework to exactly the second thing. And I have a grand total of four companies in my portfolio right now. And those are all companies that I'm excited about. Only one of those really is is something that I believe is 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 that speculation right there. I'm not obviously not here to to give everybody my bad ideas and lose the money. So I, I prefer to keep that to myself for now, at least until it's worked out. I'll tell everybody when it works out though. Um, no, but you're um you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And and I don't even think if mining fits in every portfolio, and and definitely the first part of the Lasan curve, like the first seventy five percent of the Lasan curve probably don't fit in most portfolios if you would approach it as a prudent financial advisor which none of us are right what do you think? actually let me jump in on that for a second antonio and you know i'm the independent speculator i write about commodities resource speculations mostly metals and mining and energy uh you know agriculture theoretically possibly but i, I can understand uh mining fertilizers but cows you know i'm not an expert on cows but my point, though, that I think is worth stressing is I'm, I never tell anybody don't buy anything else. I never tell anybody don't buy tech stocks or biotech or that's not my business to manage anybody's entire portfolio or to manage anybody's portfolio at all. But I'm a due diligence guy. I'm here to help them. If you've decided, you know, I want some metals and mining or some some commodities in my portfolio and I want help with due diligence. Well, hopefully, you know, they'll consider hiring me to, to do that. But but I'm, but that doesn't mean that you get rid of the rest of your portfolio. That doesn't mean you don't do anything else, uh, you know, bonds or real estate or anything else. I, that that larger picture, I leave to themselves and their financial professionals, their brokers, their money managers, their accountants. Uh, it's and um, the, the one final point on that is even Doug Casey, 
you know, hard rock mining guy that he's been for all these decades. He always says that you, you ideally as a speculator, you want to speculate on say 10 different things that are completely different markets and, you know, diversifying your copper with some nickel. That's not diversifying. They're both industrial metals, right? Or even, you know, diversifying your industrial metals with, with gold and silver. Well, yeah, that's some diversification, but they're close enough. It's not like diversifying with, with biotech mm. or commercial real estate or something else, right? Mm. Uh, or fine art even. So, you know, you're doing resource talks. I'm a resource due diligence guy, but I don't think any of us has said, do this and only this, buy nothing else. That's not the idea here. And and it goes back to what you previously said. So I think this is a good warm up understand thyself that's that, that's really the point here uh, understand the risks you're taking and your own liabilities uh your own limitations i mean and your liabilities too <laughs> uh, but your own limitations yeah okay but let's say that you and i we 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 think whatever for example we yeah, think let's walk through the curve is going through zero and we want to go and find you know a, a bunch of gold that we're going to produce to protect ourselves what do we how do we even start all right so let's say um, we're in we're, we're young enough. You have no silver in your beard yet. I'm, mine's during there, but I'm still at a phase in my life where I'm looking to accumulate wealth to create and grow wealth as opposed to preserve wealth. So I am looking earlier in the curve, and uh, I don't know if you'll put a picture up on during this talk or something like that. But you know, the early part of the curve is the discovery phase, and then you go into the boring engineering or orphan phase. And then you ramp up to production. So it's a two, it's a two ramp curve. And starting at the beginning there, I, I think the most there's a lot we could say about this. And obviously the the techniques of exploration and, and the various different kinds of deposits, there's more than we can possibly get into. But I think a very key point that is worth stressing uh, is that exploration is hard. Even the very best in the business fail repeatedly. The very best have, you know, a few successes over decades and many failures. And they're the very best because everybody else has all failures. So they, that you have any successes at all in this business sets you apart and makes you amongst the best of the best out there. Nobody, nobody delivers on every project. Nobody mm -hmm. delivers even on every company. Even your, your Robert Friedlands of the world or Ross Beatty's, the famous broken slot machine, they all have some companies or projects that don't work out. So understand that about exploration. It's hard. Even the best of the best fail. And, you know, hence it's risky and hence the reward. That's why you can get 10 baggers, 20 baggers, or even the mythical 100 baggers. I, I have seen this. I haven't bagged one myself. Doug Casey has done it twice that I know of. Um, but but they actually happen. Like this is a real world thing, it's, and it's not even necessarily a once in a life once in a lifetime thing. If Doug's done it twice, it's at least twice in a lifetime. So so this is this is what's exciting. This is what gets us interested in, in the early end of the curve. Now, personally, I have to say maybe it's because of the silver in my beard that uh, you know I'm I'm not just ready to to rush in and say okay I understand it's high risk I'm going to buy all kinds of early stage stuff and hope to get lucky. I really hate losing money. I really, really hate losing money. I'm, I'm more like Warren Buffett on this, you know, rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, see rule number one, right? I, I think that's really important. Um, and particularly as a public person who people, you know, that people follow my guidance, it, it causes me serious agony when I make a bad call and I know that people lost money. So I'm very averse to big wipeouts. How this applies to the early part of the curve is that if you're going to bet on pre-discovery exploration, the very earliest stage companies, you have to understand that that is the very highest risk area. And yes, in general, that's where you find your 100 baggers. You, you, for a 100 bagger, you need a penny stock that can go to dollars. It's very difficult for a reasonably secure company, say a, a 5 or $10 stock that has something of merit. It's, it's basically impossible for that to become a 100 bagger. Mm. Uh, even if they did mathematically, there'd be so much dilution along the way that you wouldn't have a hundred times the, the gain. Mm. Um, so 
my own personal way of balancing this is that I, I, I would either look for, for pre-discovery exploration, I would probably back prospect generators. And I know a lot of people don't like the prospect generator model because the companies give away the majority of their projects to the joint venture partners who spend all the money. But they also basically give away 100% of the risk of the highest risk stages that, you know, it's pre-discovery, the very earliest stages before the Lasan curve takes off. That's where people go broke. That's where tons of money goes into the ground and turns up nothing. So giving away 60 or 70% of your project and 100% of the risk at that very highest risk stage is actually good math. And you know what? Even if you hold on to 100% of your project, by the time you finance all that drilling, you finance building the mine and all that, you're going to dilute your shareholders anyway. So if you dilute them up front by giving away 70% of your project, it could actually work out mathematically to, then more than if you held on to 100%, but had to dilute and dilute and dilute on the way to, to producing that first gold bar or copper you know, cathode or whatever it was. So I think, you know, I, I know that some people don't like it, but from whatever it's worth, my view is that if you're going to go on that very early end of the curve, the most reasonable way to do it is with the prospect generators. What are be prospect generators? Prospect generators are companies that they generate prospects, but they go out, they find ground, they stake it or they acquire it but they don't spend the money exploring it themselves. They do a minimal amount of work to establish that there's a target they're worth going for. And then they get joint venture optionees to come in with the high risk money to explore it. So a prospect generator, a good one, will have you know a dozen or more projects and they'll have half a dozen or more companies spending their money on that high risk exploration and exchange those companies. If they make a big discovery, they get the lion's share of the upside. But you know what? If you're a little tiny prospect generator, a penny stock, and your partner makes a world-class discovery, you know, a multi-billion dollar mine, well, you're, if you're 30% carried interest in a world-class discovery, your penny stock goes through the roof. Right? You don't have to be the majority owner to benefit. Mm -hmm. It's all about you know, your stake and your dilution and how much value gets added. So I like prospect generators a lot, but it, they require patience. You know, because, remember how we started with this: early stage exploration is hard. The, the the not just normal, but most probable outcome of any exploration project from the beginning is failure. So getting other people to pay for that, it's fine; it reduces your risk. But you're still going to have to go through a bunch of failures. You know, if you're a pros busy prospect generator with a dozen prospects, probably eleven of them are going to fail. Or maybe 10 and two of them are interesting. And then along the way, you know, an endangered mosquito is discovered on one and you end up, if you're lucky, with just the one, right? So it, it requires patience. You still have to go through the failure. The, the good news about a prospect generator is that the other people pay for that failure. And you don't get diluted in the process. So what am I looking for here? Working capital, share structure, management, something else? Primarily management and experience. And you want a you want a tight share structure. You know, if they're a prospect generator with already, you know, hundreds of millions of shares outstanding, unless they're Australian, you can always just kind of divide by ten, Canada versus Australia. Um, but for most of the companies, U.S. or Canadian or even London listed, you want a nice tight share structure. If you if if there's less than fifty million shares issued, that would be great. Uh, you want a treasury. You want money in the bank. Sometimes these prospect generators collect management fees as well as um, you know buy-in fees from their optionees. So they can go for years. If they've got a couple million bucks in the bank and all they're doing is sending out some geologists to, to do some bit of surface sampling, they can go for years without having to raise money. And that gives you time to be patient and wait for them to make or, or their partners to make the discovery for them to benefit from. What, what's a reasonable salary or management fee at this stage? of a company? Uh, well, the management fee is paid by the option E, not by the shareholders. The salaries, you know, they vary. I, I look at, um, this is, I'm getting a little bit ahead, but I look at this in all of these companies. I call it the, um, there's, there's a G and A ratio, which everybody looks at. Uh, I look at the T and A ratio and forgive my crudity there, but the idea is if they're spending more money on promotion than they are on the ground, that's a problem. 
And you'll Do you see even have to spend money on promotion at this stage, though. It sounds like they don't really have to. They well, yes, you do. You still need to get your story out there. You need to hold your share price up to mm -hmm. to keep dilution to a minimum. So even if you're a prospect generator with other people's money going into the ground, you're, most of these guys will still be at the mining shows. You'll still see them there at the booth, um, but they shouldn't be spending too much. And this applies actually all the way across the Lisan curve. If people are spending more money, you know, renting airplanes to fly busloads of analysts to Botswana or wherever the heck it is and get them all drunk and have them all come back and write great glowing reports. Uh, I don't think that's the best use of shareholder money. If they're spending more on that than actually exploration. So it's not just the GNA ratio. I look at the GNA ratio versus actual value adding or potentially value adding expenditures. What, how much money is going into the ground? And if the money going into GNA, including salaries and promotion and all this stuff, is is higher than the money that's going into doing the work that will answer the unanswered question and deliver potentially value for shareholders, that's a red flag in my view. Okay. So, well, that's a red flag. That that's something that I also wanted to ask. But be, but it's not necessarily you don't necessarily have to be a geologist to be active in these things. I mean, if if the first three things check out, like they've got cash to finance the next. I don't know how much of a runway we're talking about, 24 months, let's say, or something like that. Then you have less than 50 million shares outstanding. Maybe also importantly to know who holds those shares. Like if you, if you, if can, you can locate. Right. Yeah. Some of them will disclose major shareholdings, yeah. you know, and, and uh, so like, you know, there, there are some very prolific institutions that I don't think are particularly useful signals. If you see the name Sprott, nothing against, Eric Sprott himself or anybody at the Sprott organization, but they're so prolific that it doesn't really help me sort the best of the best. And, and Sprott itself, you know, my, my friend, Rick rule is he's, he's retired. He says, but the, the ethos he left behind is he's a loan shark, right? They make sure they make money, whether the company <laughs> delivers or not. Mm. So, Again, I'm not throwing Sprout under the bus. I'm just saying they're so prolific, it doesn't help me. Where if I see the Rule Family Foundation has invested in something, that's Rick personally. That that means a lot more to me. Or if speaking of the Lasan curve, if I see that Pierre Lasan himself has invested in a company, that gets my attention. W would you ever? W well, you sure? Would you ever? Because what I see when I'm when I'm looking at the news, what I sometimes see is, you know, a very small little junior, ten million, sub ten million dollar market cap. Someone would enter the stock. Um, um, McKeown, uh, Lassand, uh, the, Robert Friedland, Abidi, the Lundins, Roy Crow. I can keep naming names, right? And then the stock would double, like on that day. Would you ever chase something like that? Would you ever buy no. something? No. no, no. We were talking about boxes to tick. And it helps me to see that somebody whose judgment I respect is involved in a company, but I would not buy just because they bought. And in fact, you know, that's, that's almost the opposite. By the time you find out about it, they're already long. That's, you know, you, you don't want to be at somebody else's liquidity event. So uh, no, I, I, you know, a, a buy-in from any famous person is never a reason for me to buy any stock, not just at the beginning of the curve, but any stock. Uh, it's it just helps me, you know. If if I respect the person, then it helps me to have greater confidence in the story. But back to what you're saying a moment ago, it's a, that's a key point because few of us in in, a, in your audience, I would assume, are geologists, and there's a tendency for people to want to be shy. Oh, you know, how can I evaluate these mining stocks? I don't know anything about the the underlying rocks, and of course, having some understanding of geology can help, but don't let that hamstring you. If you know, if you if you look at the at the PL and it's crap, sorry, that's a technical description. Or if you look at the balance sheet and it's a load of dingo's kidneys, right? You know, you, you don't have to be even an accountant or a geologist or an expert in, in, to see obvious problems. And I do recommend that people go and participate in these conferences. I don't, by the way, accept commissions from conferences to recommend participation. I sincerely believe that they're valuable opportunities. Now you understand that everybody there is trying to sell you something. To all these companies, they're hawking their stock and, and they're salesmen. Their job there is to sell stuff to you. So you, you need to understand that going in. But when you get in front of the CEO and you ask him simple questions like, what's your budget this year? How much money do you have in the bank? You know, What are the deliverables? 
and they start hemming and hawing and say, oh, I don't know. I'll ask my CFO. You know, that's bullshit. You know, if the CEO doesn't know how much money he has in a bank, he knows how much money he has in a bank. But if he didn't, that would be incompetence. Yeah. And if he did and he tells you that he doesn't, then he's lying. Either way, it's not a good look. So right. I, I do think it's, and again, you don't have to be a geologist or an accountant or or an FBI forensic, you know, uh, ex expert to figure these things out. The, the basic, like it's the 80-20 rule. You know, the basics are, are easy for anybody to get into. And okay, the other 20% would be harder and require more expertise. And maybe, you know, you'll hire a due diligence guy to help you with that. But just doing the 80%, that's easy. Asking, you know, getting in the guy or gal's face and asking the basic questions and seeing if you believe the answers. That alone will make you already head and shoulders above most of the investment herd that just sits home and, and you know, looks at a company website and says, oh, that looks good. Click. Hmm. But you, you're saying you, you might hire a, a due diligence guy or a gal, but then a, a few moments ago, you said that you wouldn't follow anybody into anything. So isn't that a little bit talking sort of against your book? Because if you wouldn't follow anybody into anything, no, no, I said I wouldn't. I wouldn't buy because a famous person bought. Yeah, well, you wouldn't follow them blindly into something, and I guess right. that's I also would, an important point. I would, but oh, I'm saying that the participation of a famous person is one box of of interest, okay. but it is never the reason for me to buy. Right. Whereas hiring an expert, like I'll do that. I, I mean, I'm not a I'm not a geologist, and if I get into something that I don't understand, well, I have a large network of geologists, so I'll I'll ask people, I'll ask my mentors, I'll ask people who've gone before me, but in some cases, I'll get into I'll look in the feasibility study and the flow sheet will be something I've never seen before. And even after 20 years, sometimes it happens. I like, I just, I don't understand why they're doing it this way. Why do they need this triple grind or why are they, you know, the, the metallurgy, there's something about this that doesn't make sense to me. So I will hire a consultant who is a metallurgist, hmm. right? Okay. To, to, to walk me through that and explain, is there a red flag here that I'm, I don't have the experience to spot? Like it might look funny to me, but I don't know if that's good or bad, right? So that's very different from just chasing after stock because, you know, whoever bought it right well, well that's i think that's a, a very important part of of the um, of the lessons here because a whole lot of people would just buy something because a talking head on the internet said so N even if it's not a robber for you it could be literally an anonymous twitter account that has a lot of followers therefore looks credible you don't know how much of that is bought you don't know what the person is into it's just following people blindly into something is a whole different thing than than you know reading other people's research right. or, or asking them for help to help you make your own decision. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, we're there on the same page. But you know what? I, I gotta say, with the advent of meme stocks, shows that if you can get early on a flavor of a day like that, you know, you if if you if you can get in early and if you can sell and not get too greedy, it is possible to make money doing this. I'm I'm not even tempted to try. You know, I'm I. I, th I think that's very difficult to replicate. And with something like that, that gets pumped up, you never know if you're the last person in the door because it's already overvalued when you get there, mm. right? You know, it's, but the, the reality is Antonio, we live in a world where meme stocks have made some people a lot of money. Now somebody gets left holding the bag at the end, but somebody made money there, so. <laughs> yeah sure i guess i guess it comes down to you know you, you go to a party when you hear a rumor that there's going to be exotic dancers and you leave the party when the exotic dancers show up how many how many people really have the discipline to do that i um i, I know i haven't built that up yet but maybe eventually so how long is is like is should a prospect generator eventually move on to make its no. own discovery no not necessarily in fact if a prospect generator starts falling in love with a project okay two answers if they if they get all excited about some still pre-discovery project and they start spending their own money on that that would be a reason for me to sell the stock they're they're abandoning the business model that's not why i own the stock and and yeah they're excited they think they're on to the next big thing but you know mother nature can be such a bitch you could have the best possible science and then you just you drill it and it's not there so no, but now if they do, if the prospect generator does make a discovery, if if they happen to do it 
off the bat before they even get a JV partner. And now, now they have something that's different because you're no longer prospecting. Mm. And at that point, you might still want to seek other people's money to offset dilution. And it might still make sense to do that. Or it might be that you have enough cash, you've built up a war chest that you can add more value yourself. So, th so that would be different. But in terms of exploration, no, I think a prospect generator should stay a prospect generator. But usually they don't make the discovery. Usually the partner makes the discovery. And then at that point, their objective is to go along for their free ride as long as they can with minimal dilution to, the sh to their own shareholders until they get taken over. And that usually works out spectacularly well. So what you want to see in that case is the prospect generator, once the one partner has made a discovery and is advancing on one of their properties, you ideally the prospect generator will spin out the rest of its properties into a new company. And that leaves the, the, the initial company with just the discovery or maybe the discovery in a couple related nearby projects to make it a little more attractive. And that becomes a takeover vehicle. You know, clearly the partners are, are going gangbusters working on the discovery and this little junior partner needs to be cleaned up. Mm -hmm. And it's one, it's easier for the buyer to do that if all they're getting is, is what they really want, the rest of the asset. And two, if, the, if that happens before you, you split the company up, then all the rest of the projects, you get nothing for that. The, the buyer only wants to have 100% interest of the discovery. They don't care about the prospect generators, 10 other projects. They're not going to pay anything for that. So you lose all any potential on those other projects if you get taken over before those get spun out. So ideally, the prospect generator spins out the discovery project into a, in a, into a new takeover vehicle. And then the rest goes into a new company, frequently named something very similar to the original company. And then they do it again. They just keep going. So the prospect generator business model continues. Okay, I, I think I get that part. What I do notice sometimes, though, is that a company would call itself a prospect generator for, or has been calling itself for 15, 20 years, but they haven't really generated anything in that period. Um, so how, how long is, is too long in this step? Like, how long do I have to... Well, to yes and no. I, I hear you. That, yeah. Uh, yeah, even, even a disciplined wandering wolf like me with patience waiting for the prey to come into range... You know, at some point, if a prospect generator just just doesn't turn up anything of merit, now, and I, I would, I would say defensively, it's not that they haven't generated anything; it's that the targets they've generated haven't had any discoveries. Yeah, and after some period of time, you have to wonder about their, uh, you know, prospect selection. It is, um, I would say, it's rare for good people to go. Like the serially successful people in this business, it's maybe one discovery per decade. And, and that could happen that they have two back-to-back, -back, you know, just a couple of years apart, and then a longer stretch. But if you've got a prospect generator that's been around for decades, and it really hasn't brought a material discovery to market, then maybe that's not the one you want to bet on. Hmm. Well, I guess that goes back to the team's... Um... To the team's background and experience and, and track record, really, because if, if if maybe they had a good track record in another life, but they haven't really done anything meaningful in the like, in the last twenty years, then is that track record still as valuable as as, as as they would like you to believe that it is? Well, okay, so you know, if if they have one discovery, uh, that's a single point, so you can't put a line on that, right? A dot on a graph, you can put any line you want around it, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that's a that's a tricky track record. But if they have a couple, you know, in the mining business, you know, that's that's more than most geologists will ever have in their career. So um, I can give you an example and a company no longer exists. So we're not even giving away any stock tips. That would be uh, Renaissance Gold, which was spun out from uh, AUEX Ventures, which was a prospect generator, made a big discovery. uh Long story short, you know, they they got taken over by the joint venture partner, which was um oh, I'm blanking. It had oh Frontier Gold. And then and and they spun out this, like I was describing, they spun out the main asset and then they kept everything else in a new company. Frontier gets taken over by Newmont. So there's a double takeover for people who got those shares. 
Uh, the new company after, and this is this was run by Ron Peratt back in the day, AUEX. And he had at the time, I think four or five major gold discoveries under his belt. And then this comes along and then Renaissance goes out there and it's, it was like a decade. It was, you know, it just seemed like, you know, property after property and joint venture partners putting money in, finding nothing, dropping the projects. And I, I don't have memorized the dates here, but it was on the order of a decade before the next big discovery came along, which is the Silicon project in the Bullfrog District of Southern Nevada, which now Anglo Gold is advancing a multi-million ounce gold deposit there. Um, and unfortunately, the when when the original JV got formed on that, it was towards a cyclical bottom in the market and nobody was putting money into anything. So Renaissance, instead of forming a typical 70-30 joint venture, they actually sold the whole project and kept a royalty. And so it's it, kind of unfortunate because then, you know, it, it, it turned into the next lottery ticket that came up a winner. And instead of having their typical 30%, they just had the royalty. But now that company has been merged into another royalty company. And that royalty is probably the most valuable asset that new company has. Hmm. Um, but the moral of the story is this is one of the most seriously successful gold finders in the world. Like the, the geological mind in charge here at the time was one of the best of the best. And it still took them 10 years of flipping through projects to come up with another winner. So it, it basically sounds to me like you have um, three different type of pre- discovery companies and prospect generators is, is just one of those types where they're not necessarily trying to make a discovery themselves and move over to you know building it and then mining it and then reclamation but then you also have the other two types which would be um a, a pre-drilling exploration company and a, a currently drilling exploration company so pre-drilling basically would be when they're still doing desktop studies is I that... don't see those as different categories. Your your prospect generator ideally is mostly pre-drilling. I, I would say there's two categories. You have prospect generators and you have self-funded. The guys are like, yeah, we think we've got great projects. We're going to explore them ourselves. We're going to spend our own money and we're going to keep 100% of the project. Hmm. Um, you know that can work out, but you're but you're looking at mandatory dilution and long odds. Uh, moving a little bit ahead in the Lasan curve. Post discovery, see the thing about discoveries, or I guess a key point, this is like absolute key point for this whole part of the curve is that nobody can predict who's gonna make a discovery. But nobody, not me, not Rick Rule, not Pierre Lassonde, nobody. Um, and that's why so many of these large, larger investors, deep pocket investors, they have a very wide net, you know, a very large dispersion shotgun approach to buying a lot of these pre-discovery explorations, a lot of prospect generators or others that they believe in, and then hoping that one big win here will amortize the losses on all the other ones that don't work out. I call it a, a, a spray and pray type of strategy. Yes. But, but if you can afford to do that and you, and you have the patience, well, it, it's, it's something most people can't do. Most people will give up before the, the mythical hundred bagger comes along. But you also need to be able to have enough money to buy it, to spray enough to get to that hundred bagger. And most people don't. Like if you go out and you have a, a manageable basket of 10 or, or maybe you're very busy, have a lot of time for this and you got 20 stocks like this, that's 20 is more than most people can pay attention to. Anybody yep. that has a life. You know, it's hard to keep up with all the technicalities and all the, you know, the the metallurgical reports and blah, 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 all this stuff. So um, so, so the odds that out of the 3,000 exploration companies out there that your 10 or 20 is going to include a 100 bagger are vastly against you. Whereas if you're, you know, Sprott or Rule or whoever, you can own hundreds of these things, you, you, you have a better chance. You, uh, if you can have a very large spray and have some intelligence in your stock selection, then maybe your odds aren't so long. And, and that hundred bagger will pay for a lot of losses. It's just, it's just not a business plan that I think works for most people. They just don't have the wherewithal and frankly, the discipline, you know, the guts to see it through. Mm. Yeah. 
That was, a, that was um, the first point again. Uh, uh, understand thyself is is important here. Yeah. All right. So so pre discovery, you I I I see only two categories really: prospect generators and self funded. Um, but here's another important thing. Then there's post discovery, and a lot of people think that oh, there's the discovery, and that's the peak at the beginning of the Lausanne curve, and from there it's downhill. That's incorrect. The discovery hole. You know, you know, if, if you can, if you happen to get in before the discovery hole, a discovery hole, yeah, that can make the stock like double overnight. Like, like literally the next day, if it's a smoking hot hole, that stock can go up 100% or more on that news. Yeah. Um, but that's the beginning of a process. A drill hole is not a deposit, right? It, it, even, even a smoking hot drill hole uh, is, at, is at best an indication that there might be a deposit there. And I have seen places where a tremendous drill hole, you know, hundreds of meters of a couple of grams per ton turned out to be a fluke, like a very narrow pipe. And there was nothing around it. Um, so it takes a series of drill holes. And so that first part of the Lausanne curve to the top before the boring engineering phase, that's actually months or even years of drilling from that discovery hole. You know, it's flat or low at the, at the beginning of the curve, and then it takes off. The takeoff is the discovery hole, not the top, the inflection point upwards. And then you have all this ramp up to that first peak in the Lausanne curve where you're drilling off your deposit. Now, there isn't you know, the Lausanne curve is is not uh, something written in the cosmic firmament by God. So there's no technical definition of exactly what the peak is. But one easy sort of rule of thumb is you could think of that first peak at the Lausanne curve as once you establish a resource. And it may not even be the first resource calculation. If you make an initial resource estimate, but you can see, let's say you've drilled off half of a geophysical anomaly, there's every reason to to speculate that that deposit is going to get much bigger, whereas mm -hmm. if you've if you've really drilled off the whole thing, you know. Anyway, you you've defined a resource, and at that point, now you just need to start proving up its economics. You need to start doing all that boring engineering work that usually doesn't move share prices, and you go into that slump. So, again, this is very important. the The peak in the Lausanne curve is after the discovery has been defined, not when it's initially being made. And there's a lot of money to be made along that peak. So what I look for in this part of the curve is what I call success in progress. And if you'll allow me the plug, there's a free, uh, not a report, there's a free essay on the success in progress play on my website. Uh, just type in success in a little search tool in the upper right at independentspeculator.com. And you'll find that that document. And it describes this thing that I'm talking about. And what I'm and the beauty of what I call a success in progress play is that unlike pre-discovery, you've already got a discovery and you're, you have data now, hardcore drill evidence that there's something here of, of merit. And as you drill that off, um, the Lasan curve tells us that there's money to be made. Now, maybe it won't be a 10-bagger anymore. You missed out on the early gains, so it's not a 10-bagger. Maybe it's only a 5-bagger. But you know what? If I can get three, four, five baggers with much less risk, I'm okay with that. Hmm. You know, I, I can see success in progress. There's, there's not a question of, is this real? Is it happening? It is happening. The question is, have I got in early enough to still benefit as we find out just how big this discovery is? Hmm. So I, I think that is a, a reasonable way for people who want to go earlier on the curve but not really swing for the bleachers with highest risk pre-discovery plays, look for success in progress. Okay, so th this is just sort of to recap, I guess, because um, it seems to be a, a common internet pleb wis wisdom out there that you sell on the resource. You know, company publishes an MRE and you're out of there. Um, there are some companies currently active that have, have had a amazing discoveries that have opted just not to go for an MRE because, and I've spoken to them on and off mic and off mic, I've been told that they're explicitly not doing it because they're not certain that's going to be adding the best value for shareholders, which to me translates in people are going to sell on on the resource because uh, a discovery is very exciting. A resource can sometimes bring reality into the mix of excitement and yes. hype and tame yes. down the, the share price. Okay, well, that's that's sort of a separate question, I, and and I can address that. But what I'm the, the point I'm trying to make is that as you're drilling off that deposit, 
the Lasan curve tells us there's money to be made there. Mm. And what I'm adding to that is it's much lower risk money. You're, you're drilling off something that you already know is there. You're finding out how big it is. The question, how big is this discovery? is an entirely different risk reward proposition from is there a discovery what that, is a discovery uh okay so that's interesting a a discovery is something that could become a mine something that would be worth mining and people will say oh we discover high grade gold in outcrop this we've made this discovery well that's not what we mean when we talk about a discovery in the lusan curve or a discovery of merit outcropping you know, it, it could be moved, it could be translated, it could be a fluke, it could be many things. It's certainly not a deposit. It's certainly not something that says, here is a mine in the making. Uh, so when, and, so, and the other, and actually in this interesting point, the discovery hole is usually really only properly called that in retrospect. When you, If you make one drill hole that clips into something really exciting, at that point, you don't have a deposit. So you you say this this might be our discovery hole. And then later you drill a few more and you say, yeah, there's something here. Well, then now you know that was the discovery hole. But the, the first time you clip it, if you're if you're a responsible um, corporate communicator, then you want to be very careful about promising that. Because if you say, oh, this is it, we've discovered our next gold mine, it's off to the races, and then the next batch of drill holes doesn't back you up your stock will fall off a cliff. And we've seen that happen too. People get all excited over one drill hole and then there's no backup. Hmm. That's what you explained with the pipe thing, sure. But, yes. but also then you don't necessarily know whether something is going to become a mine before you actually have economic No, you're studies. making a bunch of assumptions. But you know, if you start drilling consistently hundreds of meters of several grams per ton gold, or something on the order of a percent copper or better, or equivalent in other metals, right? You, there's there's characteristics where something like that has in the past usually ended up being a mine. Mm. And, or something like that is rich enough that even if it has, you know, there's some arsenic in there more than you want, or there's some complication, or there's more water there flowing through the ground that makes it harder to mine or something. You know, Mother Nature, again, she really is not very kind to geologists. She loves torturing them with some exciting, titillating discovery that turns out to, you know, just destroy their hopes and dreams and cause them to jump out of helicopters and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Um, allegedly. So, allegedly, right. I still have to watch that movie. I just have the feeling that the movie won't be as crazy as reality. But you don't have to watch it. Yeah, it. it's it's interesting if you're not in the space. But then once you understand the space, it's really mostly fluff. Yeah. Well, Hollywood. Okay. Yeah. Um, so but we we were talking about buy, buy the rumors, sell the news. Does right. not necessarily so, apply. So here. we're talking about companies and putting out your resource now. Hmm. If if companies you know clearly drilled something off. And you know the latest drill results at the edges are are dry. There's nothing there. You know it, it's it's pretty obvious that they have, you know, they might make some new discovery somewhere else or whatever. But this deposit, it's beginning to be defined, understood. Its limits are becoming evident in the drill results, and they don't put out a drill result. That's a red flag. That's not a good thing. That's not stewarding, you know, value. It's it's internally they've done a back of the envelope calculation and. It doesn't look like something the market's going to like. Otherwise, you would go ahead. Now, there's, there's, I can think of a recent case, and I won't mention company names, where there's a big discovery, and they put off putting off the the resource for a long time because they made a parallel discovery, and it made sense. Like, okay, we thought we knew how big this was, but now there's this whole other thing here, so let's wait. And and that's especially important if your initial discovery, it's okay, but maybe on the small side. If you put out an initial resource estimate, and let's say it's half a million ounces of gold at good grade or high grade even. These days, though, half a million ounces of gold is seen as a small deposit. Hmm. To really excite the market, you want more than a million ounces with multi-million ounce potential clearly visible. So if you're drilling something and you've only drilled, say, half of it or, you, or you've hit, you know, the first three out of 20 targets that you have 
and you have a small, you know, a nice looking but small resource, then it might actually be wise. And I would say that, yes, I'd take management's side on that. It is it is good stewardship of your shareholders' capital not to put out a premature resource that pegs you as a as a company with a discovery that's too small to matter. Mm. Because even, even if you do make more discoveries later, if the market, the markets have very strange memories. Sometimes they seem to have no memory at all. And sometimes they seem to remember the smallest peccadillo for decades. But if you get pegged as too small to matter, then it makes it more challenging for you to get respect for future drill results and, and growth in the resource. Hmm. So in that case where you know it seems reasonably evident that there's more upside and it can be easily drilled off, okay, maybe I'll take management side. But in general, when you have made a discovery of merit and it's it's obvious there's a deposit there it, there's not a lot of arguments for holding off too long the market deserves to know and you know what if you have something of merit if you've got a million ounces and they're averaging over a gram per ton that automatically makes it interesting so if you can come to the market and say look this is just our initial resource estimate. We've got, um, you know, 1.2 million ounces averaging 1.3 grams per ton or something. Well, that's interesting. You know, for an open pit, it's not world class, but it's big. It looks high margin. And then if you can say, look, and this is a start. This is the first of three geophysical anomalies that are identical that we've drilled. Well, you, I don't think you're cutting off your upside at all. You're telling the market, look, here's an estimate, an initial estimate for the first of our three targets. There's plenty of upside here. I think you get rewarded for that. So I would say, in, I can't give you a number, you know, 51% or 73.2%. But my, my general feeling is that if management puts off a resource estimate, usually there's a problem. Mm. But so you, Not you know, always, but usually. So you like scoping studies, that's what it comes down to. I do. I do. And it can be framed properly. Um, I remember the, the uh, uh, what was uh, the Moose River project in Newfoundland that got taken over by St. Barbara was the name of the company. There's a Stephen Dean play. I remember everything except the name of the company. Oh, Atlantic Gold. It was Atlantic Gold. And I remember having a conversation like this with Stephen Dean at the time, who was running the company. And he was worried about this first pit that they were going to put into production first and how they had all this upside at, at 15 mile and all this stuff that they wanted to do. And, and he was worried about the company getting pegged as too small to matter or, or not, you know, the market not understanding the bigger picture that he was trying to develop. And I said, well, just call it phase one. And just call it the phase one estimate or the phase one mine plan. And he says, oh, Yeah. And I remember him talking to me like a year later, oh, thank you for that idea, <laughs> because the market understood it. They, they delivered this as phase one, and the emphasis was always on the continued upside of what else they were working on. And I, and they got valuation for that. And I think that helped them actually to get taken over in the end. I'm not taking personal credit for all the success of Atlantic Gold. That's not my point here. Um, my point, though, is that if, if you have something of merit and there's upside potential, that, that can be communicated to the market in a way that doesn't have to punish your company. Mm. So, so, so far, it's basically what we've talked about is there's two options of, of the things that we've talked about so far. Noticing a discovery before it becomes a discovery and noticing a discovery that is a discovery, but noticing it before it becomes a significant or a good discovery. And you prefer risk reward wise to be in the spot where it goes from a good to a great discovery. Uh, I, I like looking at what I call success in progress. So, okay, we talked first about pre-discovery. Let's set that aside. That mm -hmm. was our prospect generators and self-funded pre-discovery. Then along that ramp up now in the Lausanne curve where discovery is being defined, I like, I, I, I think I can categorically say that I have never bought a stock on one drill hole. Like that initial discovery drill result, that alone has never made me buy the stock. I have wanted to wait for, you know, like two or even three press releases that show consistency. And then I know now we're on to something. And I, and that's, that's the success and progress sweet spot for me that I like to jump in on. Um, but even there, Say you miss something completely. Um, 
but we're getting close to the resource estimate. There, there are a lot of ways to look at this, but let's say that we're getting closer to the top of that first spike in the sun curve. And because the markets have fluctuated or maybe because the company didn't have the best IR person or for whatever reason, the, the, mark, the company is being valued like it has little or no discovery. And you're looking at the draw results and you can do it on the back of your envelope. And by the way, we talk about this back of the envelope thing. Sorry, I'm digressing here, but even a lay person can look at the footprint of a discovery in the drill holes. You can look at the sections if they provide them and look at the drill holes. And you actually can literally do a back of the envelope or more likely a sheet of paper uh, estimate of your own. You can estimate the, the strike, the width, the depth, you know, throw in say 2.6 for specific gravity, you know, get your tonnage, get your ounces, get your average grade from looking at the drill results. Like you can do this at home. All the, you know, those, all those commercials that say, don't try this at home. You can do this at home and you should do this at home. Yeah, maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's widely off the market. At least it gives you some idea. Where I'm going with this top of the Lausanne curve thing though, back to my, from my digression, is if you look at this thing, you know, it's a, it's kilometers long, right? And it's consistent and it's got a grade of it. You know, you can you can see there's room in this thing for a couple million ounces. And the company's, for whatever reason, isn't being valued like it has a discovery of its size. Betting on the first resource estimate can actually be an interesting speculation. Like if you think the market's got it wrong, you think they're going to come out with a million ounces of gold or you know, a half a billion tons of copper or whatever it is, something notable. And the valuation here just doesn't capture that, then that can be a reason to buy ahead of that. Like not, not even a, like more like a trade instead of a long-term speculation. If you can identify something that the market has misidentified, or to be fair, you could do the opposite. If there's a market darling that's just gone to the roof, it's a 10 bagger, everybody's drinking champagne about how wonderful this stock is, but you're looking at the drill results and they're inconsistent, or there are lots of really high grade headline holes that everybody's all excited about, but you look at the whole batch and most of them are low grade or narrow or there's problems, you could actually bet on the resource tanking the stock. You could go short. You could say, look, this is, this is overhyped, overpriced. There's no way this resource estimate is going to live up to this. And there's a shorting opportunity there. I've never done that in practice. Um, but I, I have identified things like that where I was right and and the resource disappointed the market. Yeah, but it's much more fun to make fun of people and CEO, CA uh, w when they're <laughs> bullish on something uh, and not actually go sure. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I've never done that as well either. But I want to go back to the uh, back of the envelope calculation they mentioned because that's something I do for myself. Um, and there's a, a simple formula that I use. I want to sort of... Uh, walk you through and you tell me if it's wrong but i would start by, by obviously calculating the the volume of the shape ideally it's a cube there's a meme for a geologist like putting everything in a cube or, or amateur geologists like doing that because it's very easy ideally you calculate the value of a cube because it's the easiest thing in the world uh then you 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 discount that by how much of that cube you think is mineralized you can see that in in some of the some of the cross sections and our stuff that the company provides. So you can say like, okay, let's say 60, 70%, whatever of this cube is mineralized. So you discount the volume of your cube by the percentage that you think is mineralized. Then you're going to uh, apply the density of the rocks to it. Different rocks have different densities. So it ranges between, let's call it 2.6 and 2.9 and on the higher end, somewhere in the middle is probably where like green stones would be 2.8 or something like those lines, something that I remember at the well, back of my head. Yeah, well, 2.8, 2.9 is pretty heavy. You probably are yeah. looking at massive sulfides or something like that to get that high. Okay. I, I, I my, my rule of thumb is 2.6. I mean, it can okay. be 2.5 or less if you've got, yeah. you know, microscopic gold and some lighter rock. Okay. But I, I basically, just to be conservative, you, you'd never want to overestimate it. Well, you'd I'm going to rather... be conservative in, in the end in the formula. But yeah, good point. Okay, so 2.6. So it's volume discount of, of how if, much. If I think. didn't use 2.6, it would be because in a company press release somewhere, they gave me the number. Like okay. if they said, we've done some preliminary tests and our specific gravity is this. Mm. Well, then I'll use whatever they tell me. Yeah. Or you could, but this is also something I guess that you could look up. If you know the exact type of uh, settings and rocks that they're in, you can look up the density of it. And there's always values that you can use. Uh, I would then apply grade to it. I would also be conservative on the grade 
Uh, this is the grade that we've seen from the company. So it could be whatever half gram of gold or whatever it might be. And then in the end, when I have all this calculated, I would discount it for conservative purposes. So I would basically make um, an uppercase, a middle case, and a, and a lowercase scenario where I would, you know, uppercase, I would multiply my assumption by 80. Middle case, I would multiply it by 60. And then lowercase, well, I would you, say. Okay. Now, I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah. By the way, I don't. I, I'm trying to get an idea of how big this is. I'm not okay. necessarily putting a value on it. So if I was going to go ahead and, and build an NPV model, then that's where I would apply a discount. But if I'm just trying to understand how big does this look, and maybe for anybody that hasn't done this math, we should maybe spell it out a little bit. Let's say you've got a deposit that's uh, 100 meters long, 100 meters wide, 100 meters, it's 100 by 100 by 100, right? Um, so a, a million cubic meters, you you multiply that by your specific gravity. So then if it's 2.6, that's 2.6 million tons, mm -hmm. and then grams per ton. Let's yeah. call it one gram per ton, just to keep it easy. That's 2.6 million grams, but we don't price gold by grams. It's you divide that by 31.25 to get you ounces, troy ounces. Yeah. So you're you're looking at a couple hundred thousand ounces in that deposit. Uh, that's uh, 83,200. So, so it's not a very large deposit. In that... I wouldn't I wouldn't then go discount that because I'm not putting a value on it or whatever. I'm just trying to get an idea for how much could how what what what's the range? What would this likely be? And given those assumptions, that's how that works out. So uh, and anybody can do this and should do this at home. And if you've got somebody that's, you know, that, oh, it's it's two kilometers long. Yeah, but it's only you know one meter thick. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's hard to build tonnage there. So it may sound really big, but you do this math and you can say, oh my gosh, this thing only has room for, you know, a quarter of a million ounces of gold. That's not big enough to matter. And yet the market is valuing it this much. Or or maybe you do the opposite. Wow, holy cow, that there's room there for 10 million ounces of gold and the company is only trading for 50 million bucks, right? So, so this is worth doing. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's an easy calculation. It's not the end all be all though. So, you know, going again, going all in an assumption like that or back in like a, a million things can happen right. in between. Yeah. No, it's just, an can be found it's just and one, one factor to consider. And, and because you'll have management will go on TV and say, well, our corporate goal is 5 million ounces. Well, fine. They can have whatever corporate goal they want. But if they're out there talking up millions of ounces and you do the back of the envelope calculation and they haven't even had hit half a million ounces yet, you know that's premature. That's mm -hmm. a good thing to know. It, it is. It is. And then after that, th there's a million other things that come in, in again, in consideration. That well, I think that could be a podcast in and of itself, by the way, where yeah. we actually you know, look through MPV calculations and other things that come in, continuity, strip, and all these important the things the recoveries that recoveries and reagent yeah. costs, yeah, all that stuff. You have very good articles, um, by the way, on um, Lobo does on, on the independent speculator.com. I don't know exactly how or what people can find them. I'll, I'll link them below because there's a bunch of educational articles and they follow up e with each other. So when you're reading something and then there's something, okay. let's say uh, Lobo was talking about metallurgy or whatever, you can click on metallurgy and you go down a rabbit hole that you're not supposed to get out before you buy his newsletter. Thanks um, for mentioning that. But a, a, an easy way for the audience to just conceptualize most of these are called cheat sheets so mm -hmm. if you use that little magnifying glass in the upper right of the website and you type cheat in there then you'll find cheat sheets for metallurgy for drill results for npvs all that stuff mm. i'm just thinking what else would be important here i made a couple of notes um let me look through some of the other stuff and see okay so risk reward yeah i wanted to talk about risk reward um you basically believe that when you're early on in the Lausanne curve, but after the the first the first hockey stick, but like at the beginning of the hockey stick, that's where you believe the best risk reward is, right? I do. I think um, you know my mentors taught me that if you're going to speculate on mining stocks or resource stocks in general, that you need to understand that you're going to lose money most of the time most of your trades will be losers. Mm. But, you know, your 10 baggers and the occasional 20, 50, or possibly even 100 bagger will more than make up for all those losses. So you have to be tough. You have to 
be emotionally secure, disciplined, to go in there knowing that you're going to lose money most of the time. Mm. And that's okay because the big wins will make up for it. Um, my experience is that few people can actually do this. It's very, very difficult. And so as a as a public figure in this space, a person who people follow my guidance, then I've changed that. I've changed the marching orders. And I'm, I quoted Warren Buffett, right? I'm much more risk adverse. I hate losing money. And I absolutely hate bringing up an idea that people lose money on. Mm. So after the discovery phase, like, so, so for example, I don't own any prospect generators. If if I was going to go pre-discovery, then I would buy prospect generators and only prospect generators. I wouldn't bother with anything else because the risk is just too high. Uh, but I I don't even own any prospect generators at the moment because they can take so long to deliver. And as you know, as a newsletter writer, much of my audience has more of a "what have you done for me lately" kind of attitude. Yeah. Whereas this post-discovery but pre-peak, you know, that first ramp up in the Lasan curve, that is a a less risky, more reliable way to make money. Mm -hmm. So I look for success and progress plays. And um, unfortunately, there's usually several of those going on in any given year. And really all it takes, instead of having to weather, you know, multiple years of, of questions and nagging doubts, what it takes is the discipline to look for real success and progress. Look at drill results where the, the management's theory is it's working, like they have a model and every time they drill, they hit, right? They have predictive value in what they think they've discovered and are now defining. You've, you need, if you can separate that from hype, from guys going on BNN or whatever and say, yeah, it's gonna be this big, yeah, millions of ounces, blah, 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 you know. That's really all it takes is, is, um, is your bullshit meter. Mm. But so, in a discovery, you made a distinguishing between a difference between and not one like one drill hole. A discovery does not make what 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 makes a discovery. How many holes would that be? Is there a fixed well, rule? You you define the discovery in retrospect. What I'm saying is what what I'm what I'm looking for to call it a success in progress, not necessarily a discovery. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking for is that. The theory, you know, let's say it's a it's a shear structure, you know, it's, it's supposed to be 30, 40 meters wide and it's got a kilometer of strike. They drill one hole, great. They drill another hole and it's similar. Okay, that's good. But they drill a third one and they're all pretty consistent. And they've only drilled the first hundred meters and there's another kilometer of strike. You know, that's what I call success and progress. I'm seeing that they have a theory. This is what it looks like. And if we drill it at this angle, we should hit it. And mm -hmm. they keep hitting it. You know, not identically, but they keep hitting it. And the gold is there or the copper or whatever it is, right? Um, I can't give you odds on this. I, ha I don't have enough examples of this where I can run statistics and say, you know, eight out of 10 success in progress plays have this times, you know, gains or whatever. Does not, I don't have it. It's partly that there are fewer examples that are clear, but it's also it's, it's kind of hard to say exactly where this starts and stops, whereas the pre-production sweet spot, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, has very clear beginning and end points that you can use. So I, I don't want to make up bullshit numbers and say, yeah, con you know, success and progress plays have a 80% success ratio and the average gain is 300% or something like that. You know, those, those would be, even if I found numbers to base such a calculation on, I wouldn't trust them. Even I myself wouldn't trust them. So I don't want to, all I'm saying is that uh, my experience is that I can more reliably make money on these than I can on betting on pre-discovery exploration. And okay. if you look at my public track record, you know, I've, I've got winners, I've got losers, but I actually have more winners than losers, which mm. gets to what I was talking about, what my mentors taught me. You've got to understand that you're going to take more losses than wins, but your big wins will make up for it. I'm actually trying to win on most of my stocks. And that's why I focus on things like this success and progress play and pre-production sweet spot, other things like that. I'm, I'm, I want to believe I, I don't make Hail Mary bets. I don't swing for the bleachers. I want to believe every speculation I make, I want to believe that this has better than 50% chances of delivering for me. Does it, and, go does, ahead. does it have to be obviously undervalued for you to do that like when you run that um no. sort of volume by grade by density formula 
Yeah, no, mm-hmm. no. I, I would I would prefer if it's a value play. I, I like to think of myself as a value speculator. I want to buy low, sell high. Mm-hmm. But there are clearly times when when that's not necessary, when something is the flavor of the day or something's going gangbusters. Uh, or, or like uranium this year. I was so confident in uranium going higher this year, even when earlier in the year people were pissing and moaning about Oh, uranium is the worst. It hasn't gone anywhere for months. Like months is an important time frame. Like you know, Rick Brule's joke about you shouldn't be doing this if a, if a long weekend is is a long time in your point of view. He makes that joke, but you can see it in real life. There was you were there, brother. You saw this earlier this year. So many people on Twitter and whatnot pissing and moaning about how uranium hasn't done anything for six months or nine months. This is the worst. Uranium's terrible. You know. And and now look at it. Like they were just impatient. And this was clear enough to me that you could buy a uranium stock and it didn't have to be necessarily undervalued. If the metal was likely to pull a hockey stick, there are a number of companies that I wrote about. There's no way this gets left behind. It's not about the value proposition here. It's about this being a stock that will respond to that hockey stick and the underlying commodity. There's no way that uranium goes vertical and this stock stays where it is. Hmm. That is a that is a valid basis for speculation. But ideally, I'd like there to be value there too. So uh, how, how would you protect yourself from chasing stocks then? Well, when everybody's pissing and moaning about how terrible uranium is and the stocks are at relative lows, then you're not chasing stocks. To my mind... Chasing stocks isn't just about the price you pay. It's it's about how you go about buying it. If you if you say you wanted to buy a company X and you thought a dollar was a good price for it, and um, and it's trading, let's say at a dollar ten or dollar fifteen, and you're, you're being disciplined, you're waiting, and then prices start moving, and instead of coming down to your dollar, it goes up to a dollar twenty, a dollar twenty five, and you're like, ah, I'm going to miss it, FOMO, right? And you change your bid to $1.25 or $1.30 to not miss out. That's chasing a stock. Hmm. Or it's in the news and it's just pulled a new 52-week high. You know, I'm going to jump on that bandwagon. That's chasing a stock. Whereas that, that's not at all what I was talking about with uranium. And, and when I was pounding the table on uranium, on your show, the stocks were not at 52-week highs. Some of them were closer to their 52-week lows. Hmm. I, I mean more like chasing a new discovery and you know, I don't want to mention particular names, uh, and I'm not necessarily in this company myself. Uh, but, you okay. know, g- gold company. There's All there's right. this particular gold company okay. that made a great discovery. Yeah. Okay. So so with if you think about what I've said about the success and progress play, it's after the initial discovery hole. So so yeah, that stock for those few lucky people who were in it before they made the, that first drill hole, and then the stock jumped up. It, by definition, I'm going to be paying more than those people who are in it. Let, let's say the stock doubles on that discovery hole. And, and here I see where you say, oh, are you chasing it? Well, Lobo, if, if you buy that stock after that discovery and, it, and it's gone up more than 100%, aren't you chasing it? Hmm. My answer is no, because the Lasan curve tells us that between that discovery and the top of the Lasan, that first spike in the Lasan curve, there's another double or maybe a five bagger to be made there. So, okay. so it, that's that's very different from, and, and on top of that, I'm not buying the first drill hole, as I mentioned before. I don't just say, oh, there's an exciting drill discovery. I'm going to buy that. I wait to see predictability and results, what I call success and progress. And at that point, I really don't feel that I'm chasing it. I feel like I'm I'm evaluating where this is going, and I'm getting in ahead of this significant rally that I see ahead for this stock. Hmm. What then is sort of your exit? I think it was clear with the prospect generators. What about this stage of the Lasan curve? What is your exit? Is it a hard and fast roll three to five X and I'm out? Um, the broad rule would be, as as our friend Rick likes to say, when the stock exceeds my investment expectations. If I think, oh, well, if this discovery is this big or whatever, and it might be a five bagger, and I'm looking at a seven bagger or a 10 bagger or whatever, if it exceeds my expectations, that's a very good reason for me to just take the money and run. Especially because after that first peak in the Lasan curve, we know we go down into the orphan phase. Hmm. So I wouldn't sell 
just on the first resource estimate? As we were talking before, if, if you get the feeling that the company is undervalued compared to the resource you think they have, that could actually be a reason to buy before that. So there's no one key trigger. It's not like they publish the first resource estimate, you sell, or they publish the first preliminary study and you sell. There, there isn't a single trigger like that. It would be, it would be more like, you know what? I've, I've made good money here. That's good enough. And then the other answer, of course, is because nobody can time these things. Nobody knows for sure when something's going to turn or, or if it'll keep going or not. So uh, we don't need to make a long thing of this right now, but there's my upside maximizer strategy, which is another free download. Type in upside or maximizer on the website, you'll find that. And the idea there is to use something like a trailing stop loss, but not, not to limit a loss, but to lock in a gain. And that way, you don't have to know where it turns. You don't know you have you don't have to know whether it's going to keep going up or going down. You you can let the wind ride and keep rising as long as it keeps rising. And then whenever it stops rising and it significantly turns, well then you exit. And so you don't have a specific exit point in mind. You just make sure that you lock in your gain. You don't lose money on it. Hmm. And you see here that Doug Casey taught you to sell half on the first double. Yes. And this oh. is my modification of that. The problem with selling half on the first double is if, if that happens on something that's really on a tear and you immediately sell on that first double, you can you you reduce your upside to the rest here. Whereas if you can let it ride until it starts rolling over, then you can increase your upside. But it's it's essentially the same idea. So you you have a big win, you take some profits, and at the very least, you can't lose at that point. You know, whatever gain ends up, you know, whatever happens at the end of the day, goes up more, goes down some, goes sideways. If you've scraped your initial investment back off the table, which is Doug Casey's phraseology, you cannot lose in the trade. Anything else after that is profit. Maybe more profit, maybe less profit, but it's pure profit, no loss. You can't lose. And I tell you, you sleep so much better when you do this. Of course. And, um, and again, like nobody went broke taking a profit. Yes. Um, but I'm still not completely sure how to exactly do that. As in, as in, like, ideally, I would, I'm, I'm an accountant, right? So ideally, I would want you to tell me some sort of a number that I just see and it triggers a selling event. But I don't, what is a sellable? Yeah, you said it, yeah, it, so it exceeded a, your expectations, but in terms of ounces in the ground? No, it, no, no, no. Hmm. It's that this would actually be about the share price and the volatility of this particular stock. If you walk through the report, it gives you some examples. And let's say, you know, this stock is on a tear, right? It's going up, but nothing goes straight up, right? There's volatility on a daily basis, weekly basis. Mm -hmm. you know, it's going up, but it's going up and down. Up. So let's say this stock, while well, it's on a tear, its typical volatility along that rise is 5 to 10%. So you wouldn't want to sell if it dropped 5% that day, or if it dropped 10% even from its most recent high, because that's typical volatility. But let's say it drops 15%. That's, that's well beyond typical volatility. That would be a good trigger to exit. Because if it sells that much more than is typical, something has changed. Maybe, maybe the underlying metal price has rolled over. Maybe they've discovered the endangered mosquito on the property or whatever. Any, you know, something unusual has happened. And since we don't know what happens next, you take the precaution of recovering your initial investment. And that would be individual per company. There's some companies that are very volatile. They might fluctuate 20% you know, along their rally. In that case, you would want to set a, a, a more wider band on your exit trigger. Mm. And there's some that are very tight. You know, they, they fluctuate very little. Some big royalty play that doesn't wiggle that much. You know, if, if something like that dropped as much as 5% all of a sudden, or, you know, that might be a good reason to go ahead and take your profits because something has changed. Mm. But that's not necessarily, uh, you're, you're speculating that something might have changed and that the market is suggesting. You to don't you. know. Yes, you're just triggering off the price. But, but again, this only applies if you already have a big win. We're not talking about necessarily walking away from the trade. You're just saying you've got this big win. You've let it ride. Like you're now well above 100%. Like it keeps going up. And then you get triggered. And you don't know why. You don't have to know why. You just have to know that you've got a big win that you don't want to have slip through your fingers. So, and, and by the way, I do this manually. 
there, there's no brokerage platform I know of that you can type up upside maximizer and it'll ask you to set a trigger percentage threshold or something, right? This is my invention. Uh, so I do this manually. And let's say I get triggered, right? Uh, oh, and by the way, I also do this on closes because intraday volatility can be crazy. I look at closes as more significant for my triggers. Mm. But anyway, read the report. The details are in there. Um, but what I do when I am triggered varies. Like, let's say it's a, it's a uranium stock, and I'm very bullish on uranium this year. Well, I'm, I'm not going to sell the entire position because my, my, my upside maximizer gets triggered. I'll probably just scrape my initial investment back off the table, like take minimal profits, just just take my initial cash back to myself. And that way, if it's a big win, I probably have even I have more money than I started with on the play, but I have zero risk at that point. Whereas let's say it was something I was nervous about. Let's say it was tin in the recent tin rally and tin rolled over. Well, you know, it's an industrial metal. I'm worried about the economy. I'm, I'm, I'm less bullish on tin. I might sell the entire position at that point. I just, instead of selling it on the first double or half on the first double, let it ride. And I might exit entirely because I'm nervous about that sector when I get triggered. Or it could be something in between, right? You, you, there's, no, there's no single answer. It would depend on my outlook on the commodity, my outlook on the company, my perception of where they're at and value added. Like if they're just about to deliver uh, you know, a, a new mine, like they're building their first mine and they're close to the to first poor, that would make me more reluctant to take more profits at that time. Mm. Does that make sense? So, so I'm sorry, I can't give you a formula, Mr. Accountant, um, but I can give you an idea. And, the, sure. and maybe the most important part of this idea is there's different ways to do it. You, you'll, you'll adjust your triggers based on your own risk tolerance and based on your, your belief in the management team and your perception of the market, blah, 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 all that stuff. But the only wrong way to do it, really wrong way to do it, is not to do it at all. To just to let your, you know, what we're doing, Antonio, is so difficult to have a terrific win and then have it slip through your fingers because you didn't lock in your gains. You know, it's it's hard enough to get this right. When you do get it right and then to have it evaporate on you, that's the worst. That's the that's worse than just losing money and making a bad pick. You you get it right and then you still end up losing money. It's it's horrible. It's painful. So Num the, the most important bottom line from the upside maximizer is just don't let big wins slip through your fingers. Mm. And you don't have to. Well, that's it's horrible. That feeling is horrible. But there's also another horrible feeling, uh, which is why we love the stock market. And that's ROMO, right? Regret of missing out when you see something 10x. And I'm thinking, how does this, what you just what? told me, how does that tie into, you know, waiting for the unanswered question? That well, there's no perfect answer. I guess the the simple answer is it's better than selling half on the first double. Okay, right? because because you guarantee that you've cut off your upside at that point by fifty percent. Whereas if you let it ride, and however you know however much farther than one hundred percent it rises, you don't know. But at least you know if you sell at one hundred fifty percent instead of one hundred percent. Or you, or you sell it a triple or something like that. It's better than selling half at the first double. So I, nobody knows you know, ultimately there. But I, I would, so therefore I would argue that the upside maximizer is my answer to Romo. Like if, if, I, had, if I had this like robotic attitude of sell half on the first double all the time, and then the stock just keeps going crazy. And I remember this happening back in my Casey days. We would take the so-called Casey free ride and the stock just kept going nuts. And, and, and I got the emails from people, you know, ah, I sold what you told me to, and it's gone up 10 times more, blah, blah, blah. People hated that. And, and, and you know, enough angry emails over the years, and even a slow old wolf like me gets the idea that, well, you know, maybe we could do better than this. Mm. Mm. So the unanswered question, then, that's something that Rick Rule always tells me. So you have to find a question. You basically have to ask the company to give you a question that they're trying to answer right now. You have to make sure that they have enough money to answer that question without diluting you. And then you have to figure out what are the chances for them answering it positively and negatively. If you think the chances are tipped towards positively, you go in and you wait until that question has been answered and you decide whether to stay for another unanswered question or whether to sell 
once they have answered it. But what you're telling me right now does not necessarily have anything to do with fundamentals. It ha it's got everything to do with stock price movement. Yes. Okay. So, but it, but but it applies when you have a big win. When that's important. The idea is not to throw Rick Rule's wisdom out the window. He's, I would agree with his process. Let's say we never got to 100%. Let's say the unanswered question was an was answered when the stock was up 80%. Hmm. Now the question's been answered. If that's the end of my speculation, maybe I take my 80%, thank you very much, and I go. Or maybe the answer to that question sets up a new question that I like even better, and I decide to stay long. Fine. Uh, I'm, I, I would not see what I have said as being in contradiction to Rick's thing at all. It's, it's in that case, when you have a big win, better than 100%, and the thing's going gangbusters, nobody knows how that's going to play out. Hmm. And, I, and again, it's important that, that I'm not saying that upside maximizer means sell. I'm not saying when you get triggered that you sell all your stock. Hmm. You okay. can just recover your initial. I mean, if you've got a three, a, a three times winner and the stock starts rolling over, but you really like the story, Antonio, the unanswered question hasn't been answered yet. You're not getting out. You could say you like it so much, you just recover your initial investment. If it's 3x up and you recover just your investment, you've got 2x your initial investment still in the play. You've got twice as much money on that investment as it, when you started, and you're leaving that money on the table while we go for that unanswered question. But you have no risk. You've recovered your initial capital. You literally cannot lose whatever happens, even if they discover that legendary endangered mosquito and it goes to zero. Right. Yes. So, uh, do you understand? I'm not talking about a selling strategy. I'm talking about locking in gains. It's called the upside maximizer, not the guaranteed exit point. Hmm. It's being, um, it, it, it's trying to be a prudent house fodder. There's something in the Belgian, uh, <laughs> tax code that says that you should deal with your money they changed it you're not supposed to see a house fodder anymore for obvious reasons that i want to get into but it's that's what it comes down to is you have to be a, a prudent house fodder with your money and if you do that in speculation then you're not going to break warren buffett's two main rules that's what it comes down to right Good. i like yes. it that's so exactly what, my idea what kind of skills do i need to do that like if i if i turn off this video well, it's night, so I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go to sleep. But if I turn off this video and I want to learn more, do I do finance? Do I do geology? Do I do psychology? What, what are, what's the next field to go into if I want to make money? Well, it's interesting that you threw psychology in at the end because I would argue that's that's more important than anything else. I mean, really, I talked about you go to the shows, you take out your bullshit meter. If there's, if there's the single most important attribute that a speculator can develop, a successful speculator, you know, there are a lot of important attributes. You know, I talk about discipline. I talk about a lot of skepticism is, is perhaps even more important. Like you can, you can have disciplinary lapses, but if you're cautious, or my way of putting it is if you assume bullshit, you'll rarely be disappointed. And for some reason, you, you, Grown adults with decades of experience, silver hair, they'll go into a mining show and somebody will tell me an exciting story and they'll get gold fever and and, and they'll forget to assume bullshit. They'll, I, I just don't know why this happens. Maybe it's the um, dimensions of the girl at the booth or something that distracts them from the, the basic proposition here. But you, psychology is one way of putting it. Um, Skepticism is the cardinal virtue that I've discussed. I call it the bullshit meter. If, I, I think that's that's absolutely critical because every single company, there isn't going to be any company that you're going to meet that on their PowerPoint or the CEO at the booth or whatever, they're not going to say, yeah, we got kind of a crappy project, but it's all we got. So we're going to drill it. We see if we get lucky. You're never going to hear that. But that's actually the truth for 90% of them, maybe more. They're all going to tell you how their project is the cat's meow. It's the best thing you're going to see in the whole show, blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. th th this isn't a question. This isn't if, when, whatever. This is just an absolute mandatory. You must be skeptical. You must develop your bullshit meter. And you don't need to have a PhD in geology or finance or any of this other stuff to do that. You, it's just mental toughness and it, maybe maybe that's a personality trait. Maybe some people are more naive and it's harder for them to do. 
But school of hard knocks, I think it is an attribute that anybody can develop. Maybe maybe some people have a starting point advantage, but everybody should be able to develop their own bullshit meter, Antonio, and or at least they should try. Mm. So it's psychology first to help you develop the person the the BS meter. Okay, absolutely. Sense. I wrote down I wanted to make them ten, but I only made them nine, so it's not as clickbaity. But I wrote down nine stuff that that I'm taking away from all this, uh, like the the very sound bites of it. But there's a, a bunch of more things in there. First thing that we went through was understand thyself. Second thing that we that that I that you that that everybody should learn is that exploration is hard. Nobody can predict finding and discovery. So start with that framework in mind, knowing exploration is hard. Then you, you told me that you like uh, prospect generators more than um, just pre-discovery companies. And the fourth one was don't follow blindly. Uh, do, you know, do, do look at other people's work, but don't follow them blindly. When it comes down to, and it, there's a fifth one, but I guess it, it, it has um, effect on the third one that I mentioned. So when it comes down to figuring out what companies to look into or, or what companies to proceed with your research into on the prospect generator side, that would be share structure, working capital, which is cold, hard cash, preferably not nothing else, and a management and uh, their prior experience and their prior successes are really what's important here. Um, then you told me, though, although you like the prospect generators, you thing the best risk reward is in what you call success in progress so not the first hole but something that has a decent chance at eventually becoming an ore body a mineable ore body so success in progress you need to use the formula that we went through which was volume by grade by density of the rocks or the gravity of the rocks um and you need to divided by divided by uh grams per ounce divided by grams per ounce okay um and you need to, you, you, so you need to use that formula so that you understand whether something is overhyped or potentially underhyped. Then we talked about the upside maximizer. Again, that's going to be on your website uh, for more detail, but it's basically sell it when you exceeds your expectations and use one of the selling strategies from the upside maximizer. And yeah, the last one was, as we just talked about the skills needed that I wanted to write down. First thing would be psychology and developing your BS meter. Which I think, unfortunately, you have to pay for one way or another. You either pay for it in, <laughs> in losses or in time. You just, you know, over time you smarten up, or both. Over time you smarten up, so you lose a bunch of time and you lose a bunch of money in the process too. And then eventually, maybe you smarten up. So those are my main nine takeaways. What do you What do you make of all this? Anything else that I'm missing? Sounds pretty good. And you know, it'll be fun to get into the rest of the curve in another point. Yes, sir. Yes, and absolutely. Well, thank you so very much for investing your time in me. I really appreciate you doing this, and I really am looking forward to our next conversation. Thank you, Antonio.